it's not always going to make 100% sense right away. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, I just always tell that to people because people get a complex. Like, I don't get it. I don't understand. Oh, yeah. Forget yeah. it. Right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't get it at first. I don't ever get poems at first. It takes time and many readings. Welcome to the Talent Grow Show where you can get actionable, results-oriented insight and advice on how to take your leadership, communication, and people skills to the next level and become the kind of leader people want to follow. And now, your host and leadership development strategist, Haleli Azulai. Hey there, talent growers. Welcome back to another episode of The Talent Grow Show. I am Haleli Azulai, your leadership development strategist here at Talent Grow. And this show is brought to you by Talent Grow, which is the company that I started in 2006 to develop leaders that people actually want to follow. So this episode is in celebration of summer. I thought we could do something a little bit out of the ordinary. And I am bringing to you poetry for leaders. My guest, Kirk Barbera, is going to help you see what's in it for you as a leader to read poetry and how to overcome the barrier that a lot of us have including yours truly, to reading poetry because it is not something that comes natural to me and I'm trying to learn it. And Kirk is an amazing teacher and he has a podcast all about this. So we'll talk more about that. You'll hear it in the show. And he's going to read a poem and we're going to learn how to read it, how to understand it, how to analyze it and converse with it. So I think that you're going to like it, but I'd love to know what you thought afterwards. Without further ado, let's take a listen. Talent Growers, I'm here with my friend and colleague, Kirk Barbera. He is a media producer for the future. Kirk says media has fundamentally changed. New methods, models, avenues, and technology make media more accessible than ever before. And Kirk has produced thousands of videos, podcasts, articles, books, novels, plays, and more. He is editor-in-chief of the literary magazine, Troubadour Magazine, and the host of the Troubadour podcast. Kirk also is on my team with the Talent Grow Show, usually working in the background and supporting the marketing efforts. And we are really excited to finally get him on the front end of the show. And this is going to be an episode about a topic that is definitely unusual for us, which is poetry for leaders. Kirk, welcome to the Talent Grow Show. Thanks for having me. It's um, cool to really be on here for once. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Well, before we get into poetry, I always ask my guests, as you know, to describe their professional journey briefly. Where did you start and how did you get to where you are today? Well, you know, I've heard this so many times on your show. And, you know, so I always think about this and how unusual it is for many of your guests and for myself. And, you know, I started selling knives out of high school and did that for several years, did pretty good. I put myself through film school afterwards, and then I did a smattering of job. I was a literature teacher. I worked at a think tank. I you know, worked in marketing for another think tank, and I just did a whole bunch of different things. But when I you know, look back at the through line and the goals of my life from being a late teenager to today, it was always literature. I was always interested in, want, you know, I wanted to write screenplays and novels and short stories. And, you know, that's always been what I'm, I've done. And a lot of these skills, I guess, um, looking back now, I'm 34, trying to develop the skills necessary, the, the subsidiary skills necessary in our new futuristic media world, where in a lot of ways, you got to do it all yourself. And so learning sales and marketing and editing and, and all the, you know, and videography and podcasting, like all those things that are necessary to get my words into other people's ears or minds as quickly as possible. So that's been, I think, what a lot of my journey has been about. I agree with you that one of the cool things about my show, and I always enjoy that part, I don't, I hope actually listeners, I would like to know if you enjoy it, but I love to hear about people's meandering paths because they're rarely a straight line. And it just shows that we are all kind of on a journey that is purposeful in one way or another. It just teaches you lessons and it shows you what you like, what you don't like, what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you're curious about, what you want to do more. I also always admire people that are sort of self-made. You know, you 
you kind of created a career for yourself that centers around your skills and your strengths that's unique. That's not sort of cookie cutter or, you know, it's not like a job you look, you know, look in the wanted ads and find this kind of a job and you just made it for yourself. Personally, as a listener, I think it's a really great part of the show because it is a very interesting part of human life, the resume life. When you ask the question, and this is like a literary poetic question, what is life, right? What is my life? Who am I? And that's such a difficult question to answer. And thinking about it and organizing your life around, many people have different ways of doing this, but I think it's an important skill to have to think back on what skills am I really good at? What jobs was I happy in? What jobs was I not happy in? You know, and why? So today I brought you on because I figured, you know, it's summertime and lots of us are thinking about what do we want to read on the beach or what, you know, vacation or kind of doing things that are a little bit more adventurous. And you have a show. I, I was a guest on your show, which I think at the time, I don't know if you've changed the name of your show, actually. Yeah. So it was an earlier iteration yeah. called Poems for People Who Hate Poetry. Yeah. Yeah. And at first I was like, well, I don't know if I want to put myself with that label. I don't hate it. I just can't connect with it so well. It never really lands well with me. So I always feel like I'm missing something. So it was just never an art form that I was very drawn to. But I do appreciate the role of art in life. And I think that's something we'll talk about. But you say that when we look at really great leaders across history, a lot of the admirable leaders that we quote were lovers of poetry, like George Washington, Abe Lincoln, John Wooden, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, and the list goes on. And you say that when we see a really, truly epic leader, a lot of the times they do read at least some poetry. You mentioned to me before we started recording that one of those classic best-selling self-help books of all times, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, included numerous poems. So clearly you think that poetry is important for leaders. I'd love for you to talk about why. Why do you think leaders need poetry? And if you're trying to be a leader and you're using these guys as models, like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Churchill, whoever it is, Abe Lincoln, if you have that, you should try to think about how did they think about life? And often the way they thought about life was filtered and improved in their literary endeavors. They were often very, you know, Jobs loved Herman Melville and Shakespeare. And, and you get this in his marketing, for instance. So my point is that you emulate these guys and you learn from them. One thing to think about is don't cut out segments of their, their life, one being their, their literary endeavors or their literary desires and, and goals. But one thing, you know, I always think about is like, what are some common skills that are actually unique to leaders? Right. You know, if you think about like, what is a big challenge a leader in an organization has when they enter? Like, probably, you know, if you were to label two or three top challenges of getting a new project put forth, I mean, what do you think is one, just out of curiosity, in your endeavors on this show that's come up a lot as a challenge? Well, yeah, I, of course. In my job doing leadership development in organizations, I get asked about this all the time what is leadership or what's yeah. leadership involved? So there are so many different things, but one of the big ones that I think is definitely related to poetry here is that you need to be able to articulate a vision. Mm -hmm. People need to know what their goal is and they need to know where they're going, how they're doing it together, and why that's compelling, why they should work hard to achieve it. Yeah, and you said that better than I was even thinking. I was just <laughs> like, because I, and I like that you focus on the articulate part. Mm -hmm. Communication is how uh, that's how I thought about it. But yeah, articulating a vision is really challenging. That's even more complicated, I think, than just even one-on-one uh, -on -one communication or one-on you know group communication. And really studying. You know, I know we don't like the word study, and I hated school, just mm -hmm. like I I uh, hated poetry as well until I was 28. I loved literature, reading novels and such, but not poetry for some of the reasons I think that most people have pushback on it. But what I've learned is that when, you know, if you stretch your mind to really go stanza by stanza, which we're going to do with a poem today, briefly, A Psalm of Life by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And when you have that training and you ask, like, what does this word mean? How does it fit into this phrase? You know, why did he use this phrase? What is this analogy really trying to Put across, you know, what is this simile? And I know these are words that you might have had from school and you don't like them as much. 
And that's fine. And you don't need to have the expertise right away to get started. But when you start just asking questions like, what does this mean? This line, what does this word mean? It trains you to be more capable of communication. It gives you a better ability to actually convey your own thoughts because you're going into the mind and the thoughts of another, usually if it's a great poem, a genius of communication and language. That's a good point. I like it. Yeah. One analogy that I think of, and I think of analogies all the time, and I I think... Me too. And one of the reasons I'm able to do this is because I read so much literature. So I'm constantly coming up with analogies and I, I play with analogies. I think a lot of people don't do that. Like they don't actually, you know, they have a certain thought in their mind and they don't play around with it. And poetry helps you to be a little bit more playful with language. But one thing I was thinking about is like, and, and this is just like, and in, in thinking about for your show, so this is brand new for me, an analogy between the mind and the body. And to me, it's, it's very obvious. If you train your body, you should train your mind. And, you know, one way to train your mind is to read books, but an advanced way to train your mind, I think, or another way is to read poetry as well. And poetry is our form of books. But I mean, imagine this scenario, <laughs> like imagine you live in a world where all, everything's the same, sports are all the same, everything like that. But in sports or in the world, nobody has ever heard of or thought of or even tried lifting weights. Mm-hmm. So nobody does this. And then you join the NFL. Right. And yeah. so everyone, they can, they can run, they could do push-ups and, and air squats, but there's no external weight. It's just their body, the calisthenic stuff. Uh-huh. And then you go in there and you're lifting 800 pound weights, right? <laughs> like, a, like an NFL player, you know, or squatting 800 pounds, you're benching 480 you're not 500, you know, like you're a beast. I mean, how are you going to do in the world against all those other guys? You're going to be much better. You're going to crush them. Right. <laughs> and you know, the, the people often ask me like, do you have a book recommendation? And I don't usually have book recommendations until I get to know you, but I do have a phrase that I like, which is if you read what everyone else around you is reading, then you will think what everyone else around you is thinking. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have an extra edge, I highly recommend reading things that are over 60 years old, maybe even classics of certain sort, and really training your mind in a completely different way. That'll give you an extra edge on, you know, what other people are thinking. Cool. I like it. So it sounds like so far we talked about how having poetry can help you be a better communicator and also a more agile and creative thinker. Yes. And, you know, in that vein, maybe we can explore a poem briefly and, and yeah. give it a taste. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Town Growers, this is what Kirk does on his show. And so we will link to that in the show notes and you can go and listen and learn way more than he can do on this show. But I thought that this would be a nice exposure of something that's a little bit different. And, you know, when Kirk and I were planning and preparing for this episode, he suggested, I I said, I want a poem that's related to leadership and, you know, that we can do something that that seems relevant for you, Town Growers. And Kirk suggested a variety of them. and, And I chose the one that we're going to do, which he mentioned already, A Psalm of Life by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, because to me, it was just the most resonant. It was easier for me to understand than the other ones. And I like the message of it. So Kirk, you're going to read it to us? Yes, I'll read it. Hopefully you guys are motivated. And I I just want to start by saying it's not always going to make 100% sense right away. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with you. (laughs) <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, I just always tell that to people because people get a complex, like, I don't get it. I don't understand. Oh, yeah. Forget yeah. it. Right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't get it at first. I don't ever get poems at first. It takes time and many readings. So that's good to know. Okay. So don't feel bad. It's okay. Just I'll, I'll read it slowly and then we'll go through it a little bit. Okay. So this is A Psalm of Life by Longfellow. And it's got a little quote at the top that says, what the heart of the young man said to the psalmist. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way. But to act that each tomorrow find us farther than today. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still, like muffled drums, 
are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act. Act in the living present, heart within, and God o'erhead. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime. And, departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing, shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing, with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> I never get claps on my show. <laughs> so what do we do now? How do we break this down? I know at this point, you've probably heard it and maybe listened to it a couple of times, but if you're a listener um, listening for the first time, one thing to always look for is, did it resonate on any level with you at all? Like, even if you don't understand it all, which you probably won't, did it feel good on any level? And if it did, then it, it means it's a good sign to keep read it again and now take the time to go through it. If it didn't, move on. You want to find poems you actually like. And I, I think this is so important because if you don't, you're going to get the wrong mentality and then you're just not going to read any poems and you're going to miss out on all the. Yeah. Then it's like, oh, it's good for you, medicine. Take it. It's bitter. Good yeah. for you. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. So find the stuff you want. And then now that you like it, so I'm going to, going to assume you like this poem. I did. I, I do just what's called, you know, I just, I call it sometimes like converse with verse or a stanza by stanza, just breakdown. Mm -hmm. And all you really need is a dictionary and your mind and maybe Google. <laughs> you look it out too. But this is where you just actually think about it. So one thing to think about is it starts off and everything in a poem, including the title, is important. So this is a psalm of life. Now, I had heard the word psalm, P-S-A-L-M, of course. But when I first read this poem, I wasn't 100% familiar. I don't, I don't come from a very religious family. So I wasn't super familiar with psalms right? And what they actually are. But a psalm is essentially a sacred song. It's a song that we, you know, you, if you go to church, there's, there's a whole book of psalms and you would read it. It's, you know, it's something about the glory of God or the glory of this. And, but it's a sacred song. So it's an you know, important song. So this is a sacred song for life, right? That's, that's the structure of this or the, the framing of this whole poem. And then you have what the heart of the young man said to the psalmist. Now, this is the framework. It's, it's the heart, like a young man, it's his heart is saying this to a psalmist. So you could think of, you know, um, I picture like an 80 year old church going man on stage, a priest who's reading Psalms, like a psalmist. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That's the kind of framework we have. Now, what does the young man say? He starts by saying, tell me not in mournful numbers, Life is but an empty dream. So what do you think he means by mournful numbers? And if you don't know, that's okay. I, I have something to start us off with, but I just thought I'd ask you, Helene. Yeah, I, I don't exactly know. I mean, the only thing that comes to my mind, but I think this may be just a stretch, is like numbers are like your age. Like you go up and up in age and you are sorry that you're getting older because you're going to die. Yeah, I think that's part of it you know, tell me not in mournful numbers. So like the way I think of it is, yeah, I think there's an, an aging component, like you're saying, like life is but an empty dream. We're all going to die. It's all about the afterlife is what I'm getting after this is, mm -hmm. is mournful numbers. Like if you do the numbers, everyone dies. Look at the trillions of people who've died. <laughs> that's, that's, our, that's our fate. And this is a young man, yeah. right? This is the heart of a young man. He's like, tell, don't tell me these mournful numbers that Okay, yes, you have the numbers. There's trillions of people in the afterlife. Fine. Don't tell me it's an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. Now, I think what he's saying there, it, it just simply speaking, that if you live like that, you're already dead. Yes. Right? Yes. So if you live like, you know, oh, let's just wait for the grave, because that's where the important stuff happens, then, you know, you're wasting your life. That's right. And now a prose person, if I was writing an essay, that, that's how I'd write it. 
But a poet talks about the soul is dead. He talks about if you slumber with your soul if, and then things are not what they seem. So I think this is kind of questioning the mournful numbers that we just heard about. It's like, yes, you have the trillions. I have one, but things are not what they seem. Like the one is important. That's how I look at this. Okay. Okay. Now, but I think you were on the right track. So like, even if you interpreted it slightly differently, you, you know, we're getting older, the more than, you know, I'm counting up the numbers, but you know, it, it sounded like when I said the soul is dead, that slumbers, that this resonated with you when I said you're already dead if you act that way. Yes. Right. So I think we were on the same page, even though I might've had a slightly different interpretation. And that's fine. Like that's, that's good, but we were still on the right path together. I don't know if there's like a right or wrong answer. So it's, you sound to me like you're saying uh, generally whatever it means to you is okay. I remember certainly in school, you get a bad grade if you didn't produce whatever the teacher would think is the right answer. So I think that that self-judging you know, and feeling inept about reading poetry probably comes from there. Well, and this is why I call it converse with verse though. It's an interesting question you you bring up. And just real quickly, I think it's just there are multiple perspectives. But the idea of a perspective is that we can be looking at the same object, but from different planes, different places, right? So you could be on top of a mountain. I could be under, like right in front of the object. We're going to see it differently. Or you could be on the left side. I could see the right side. We're looking at the same object, but we're looking at it from different perspectives. Mm-hmm. And so the question of conversing and, and kind of, you know, the discourse of going through something is me learning your perspective. Because I think your perspective isn't one I thought of, but it's actually very related. The idea of aging and dying, obviously. And me, I thought of like a whole bunch of dead people, like mm-hmm. people in the grave, like all those skeletons. Like that's what I thought. It's, we're talking about the same thing, just from a slightly different angle. Yeah. And so by talking about it, this is what I hope people will do with poetry. Talk about it. We see where the similarities are. And that is thinking, by the way. That's what thought is. Yeah. It's integrating these different elements. Okay, let's keep going. So life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. So I think this is kind of saying similar things. So we can kind of go through this, dust thou art to dust returnest. That, you know, I think he's, again, having the conversation with the psalmist and saying that's not the case, right? Life is real. It's earnest. It matters. Okay. So I'm going to skip that, that stanza. Yeah, that, that wasn't too hard to understand. And I tend to agree with it. You have to live your life. Exactly. Live your life. And I think that's an important part of this poem and of life. Um, not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way. So now the way I take this is the psalmist is starting to get, or excuse me, the, the young man is starting to get more confident. And he's saying that this is what it is. It's not, in, it's not enjoyment or sorrow, uh, and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act. So he's saying it's not about pleasure. It's not about sorrow. It's about action, right? That each tomorrow finds us farther than today. Yeah. So it's not just action. To me, that also says yeah. developing yourself or growing, you know, so you're, yes. not, you're not just focused on the momentary pleasure or, or the, sens- the sensory experience of every moment in an isolated vacuum, but recognizing that, you know, the purpose of life is to keep growing and developing and improving and taking actions towards that. So it's like the difference in in positive psychology, they talk about the difference between hedonism and living life with purpose, which is different. Like it is still happiness, but it's not that momentary happiness. It's long-term happiness. And when you think about it in the context of the entire poem, So we're not going to go through all the stanzas um, just for time. But if you think about the entirety of the poem, what does the poem end with? Right. And and to me, a poem is like a puzzle and you have to use the whole, the the totality of the poem to unlock each of the lines. Mm -hmm. So the poem, remember, ends with the lives of great men. Right. So the young man talks to the psalmist about what life is. And what you just said is very relevant to, it's about building a character. Mm -hmm. What kind of character? Great men. Why? Because they remind us, this is toward the end of the poem. Yeah. The great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime. Yeah. They give us like a role model or an example and they leave a legacy behind. And departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Yeah. Now, I love that saying. That's actually a famous quote that you'll find a lot of people in speeches will use. Mm-hmm. 
and um, you know, leaving footprints on the sands of time. And that is one of the things that makes poetry special is that it gives you those kinds of visuals that also represent something abstract, like a legacy. Yeah. Footprints on the sands of time yeah. really leaves an impression. Yeah, it's really nice. Perhaps another sailing or life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. I think what one of the things the poem's saying is we're getting this idea of the sacred song of life and the purpose of a, a overall purpose of life is to build a good life. So, and one ex- reason for that, and you know, is this legacy idea, right? Is this idea of the purpose of it is that, you know, one, it's, it's good in of itself. That's what sublime essentially means. We can make our lives sublime. It's basically grand, admirable, and beautiful in and of itself. Mm. It's worthwhile for, in a, for its own sake. And by the way, I know that because I looked these things up. So, yeah. we, you know, I recommend, you know, we're not going to go through the whole poem. So I hope you go through and look up words, even if you think you know what the word is. But my, you know, the point is that I think that that is a big part of what this song, this sacred song is, is it's for this great man and for the great man or woman in you, right? The, the potential that you could be bringing out if you live life this long, this way. Yeah, I also see that. Like, there's almost like he's listing reasons for why you should pursue life, you know, as an end in itself, and not just as a means to an end of like the afterlife or some, or or just sort of live in apathy and and not care, you know. Like, don't be like dumb, driven cattle. You know, you can be a hero. So he's he's sort of calling on us to be our best self, which is part of my, you know, my mission is yes. to help people be actualize themselves and and be their best self. And this idea of action and that the people that we admire, you know, he's sort of reminding us, those you admire, those great people, that it's because they lived in a way that that is like that. So take heed and and notice their example and then be that person for others. Exactly. And I think he's saying it's an end in itself because he's relating it to a psalmist, right? And uh, and, and the idea of what a psalmist might say is, you know, it's the afterlife that's important. He's saying it's life that's important. Yeah, it's almost like talk back. Like he's exactly. talking back to the psalmist. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's important that he says the heart of the young man. So it's, it's like, this is what the young man wants to say. Wants to say. It's the emotion. And that's one thing poetry does really well is it conveys emotion in concrete words. Mm-hmm. I like the be not like dumb driven cattle. Yeah. And I think this is always a danger. And when we think about like, leadership skills and what it means to be a leader. This, I think what this poem poem represents and what it says is part of it, right? Inspiring the people to live their best lives and to be better, right? Like what your mission is. I think it doesn't matter what leader you are. It doesn't matter if you're a sales leader, if you're, you know, a leader of a, a financial group and everybody's just, you know, or everybody's CPAs or what, it doesn't matter. Part of your job, I think that is, you know, separating the engineer from the chief engineer that oversees all the engineers is bringing out the best in those individuals. Yeah. That's one, if we were to isolate one important thing that a a leader does, I think that's it. And that's what this poem is about is, you know, it's, it's the young man or the young leader speaking to this, you know, idea of not making the most out of your life, not building the building the character within yourself. You know, I think that's kind of the message of this, this poem. Great. Well, Kirk, this is this is really interesting, and I wish we had more time, but as you know, we don't. So I'm I'm glad that we were able to go through a whole poem like this together, and I hope that talent growers have enjoyed it, and they'll probably check out your show to learn more about those other poems that you break down like this, conversing with the verse. Before you give one specific actionable tip, what's new and exciting on your horizon these days? Yeah, at Troubadour Magazine, I have our fourth edition of the e-magazine coming out where we compile great, uh, mostly I'm focused on romantic literature uh, from the 19th century, but we're, we're focused on that and it's short stories and poems. And there are occasionally some new ones, like modern ones that I, of people I've met over the years publishing today. And the purpose of it is to help you gain a broader perspective on literature and, and kind of increase your abilities. So, you know, that, that's the main thing that I'm working on, troubadourmag.com. All right. Well, what's one specific action that you recommend talent growers can take today, tomorrow, this week to upgrade their 
I don't know, their leadership skills or their own literary skills, however you want to take this? Well, so (laughs) I think the easiest thing based on what we've talked about is to go to either go online or go to Barnes and Noble and get um, just a generic book of poetry, like just uh, that holds a whole bunch of different poems, especially if it has it categorized by topic. And then just every once in a while, just flip through it and just read. If you don't like it, just move on. But I really think everybody needs to have like a really big book of poetry. I like big just compilations of poetry over the decades or over the centuries, um, starting with Shakespeare going on. And I wouldn't start with Shakespeare, but anyway, I would just buy that and then flip through it and just, you know, every once in a while, see if you like anything. And then you just read. And then should you do something? Should you, should you journal? Should you make margin notes? What should you do? We tried to model this today. I, like yeah. I said, the first thing is read it. If you like the sound of something, then read the poem again and again, and then get a dictionary and, you know, break out some words and try to do what we did in asking those questions. But, you know, in general, you just, you want to look for stuff that just, for whatever reason, it could, it could sound, just the words might sound pretty. That's it. That's all you need. You just need a, an entry. If it doesn't do anything for you, just move on. Okay. Right? And uh, don't force yourself to like something because you heard it was a great poem that you're supposed to like. Yes. Good. That makes it so accessible. So I really appreciate you, Kirk. I know people are going to want to stay in touch and learn more about you. So what's the best place to follow you online? And where where can they stay in touch? It's mostly uh, Troubadour Mag on Facebook, YouTube, and the website. Those are the main ones. We're going to link to that in the show notes. And that's it for time today. And I really am glad that you stopped by, Kirk, and shared that with us. I hope that talent growers liked it. I don't know, guys. Listen, let me know what you thought. Well, thanks for having me on. Thanks, Kirk. Well, that's it, talent growers. I hope you liked it. I am so curious to hear what you thought. And I would like to know also if you read the poem and want to talk with me more about any of the stanzas we did not discuss because we were running out of time. Or if you have another poem that you really like for uh, leadership, you know, kind of like salve for the leader's soul or how you've used poetry or literature in general in a unique way as a leader. I'd love to hear these stories. Please let me know. I love to hear from you. A little note, this is August here, August 2019. If you're listening to this in real time, we're going to take a vacation break in August, but rest assured, you will still receive a new podcast episode every week in August. And what's going to happen is I'm going to rebroadcast three interesting and important or unique episodes from the archives of some of the shows in the earlier days of the podcast that I think that either you may have not heard or it's been a while since you heard them so that you can have new content to listen to each week while I'm on vacation. So I hope that you like that and I look forward to hearing about that from you too. All right. Well, that's it for another show. I'm Halalia Zulai, your leadership development strategist here at Talent Grow, and this is the Talent Grow Show. Thanks for listening. And until the next time, Make today great and make the summer great. Thanks for listening to The Talent Grow Show, where we help you develop your talent to become the kind of leader that people want to follow. For more information, visit talentgrow.com.